Welcome everybody as you're joining us for today's textile talk. Thank you everybody for joining us. We'll get started in just uh, 30 seconds or so as we wait for everybody to join. Thanks to everybody for using the chat to say who you are and where you're from. Hi, Luana. Hello, everybody in Nebraska. I see people from Texas, Utah, Ohio, New York, San Jose, Kansas City, Michigan, Argentina, Boston. Canada, Florida, fabulous. Um, I'm going to get started now. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm to the, in the 14th of a series of textile talks. Uh, I'm Nancy Bavore, director of the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. And just in case this is your first textile talk, I want to tell you a little bit more about them. Uh, they are every Tuesday, or I'm sorry, every Wednesday um, at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and recordings of the talks are available <clears throat> a few days after the lecture. And if you have registered for a textile talk in the past, you will get an email about the next week's presentation, or you can check any of the participating organizations, websites for info and links to the recordings. So several months ago, six organizations, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, Quilt Alliance, Modern Quilt Guild, Surface Design Association, and the International Quilt Museum partner to present this series. Um, next week's talk will be presented by the Modern Quilt Guild, Finding My Way Back Home. And Marquetta Johnson and Amanda Hines Bernay will discuss Marquetta's long family history of quilting and art. Um, I also want to thank our generous sponsors for their support eQuilter, Misty Fuse, Moda Fabrics and the quilt show. And I hope you will all patronize our generous sponsors. Also, so that we can continue to offer the talks for free, I hope you will consider making a donation to each week's presenting organization. And we will put a link in the chat, or you can visit the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles website to make a donation. And thank you for considering that. So one last bit of business before I introduce Patricia. You'll notice at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A button. So if you have questions for Patricia, write them here. And there's a new feature so that if you have a similar question, you can put a little check mark by the original question rather than just repeating it. And we'll take time to answer as many of those questions as possible in the time we have today. And do continue to use the chat section to say hello to everybody. It's fun to see who's here and where they're from. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Patricia Montgomery, Oakland-based artist, Oakland, California-based artist today. She received her Bachelor in Fine Arts from Holy Names College in Oakland and her Master's in Fine Arts from John F. Kennedy University, also in the Bay Area. And in her over 20-year artistic career, Patricia has had numerous one-woman shows and group exhibitions, both national and international. She's received several prestigious awards for her work including recognition by the Alliance for California Traditional Arts Program in 2011. And in 2013, um, Patricia received a very competitive Creative Work Fund grant from the California Arts Council. Um, I first was fortunate enough to meet Patricia in Houston in 2017, where um, she presented an exhibition of swing coats celebrating African-American women who made major contributions to the civil rights movement. And I was just really moved by her story, Coats, that tell the stories of these remarkable women. So I'm especially pleased to say that in 2018, uh, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles exhibited her work in the exhibition, honoring the heroines of the civil rights movement. And you're in for a real treat today as Patricia brings to life these heroines in her artwork. So Patricia, take it away. Thank you for coming today. And, and I'm really looking forward to today's presentation. Well, thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, this project was made possible in part by a grant from Creative Work Fund. It is a program of the Walter Ellis Highs um, Fund supported by a generous grant from William and Floyd Hewlett Foundation and the Irvine Foundation. Oh, 
we all know about Rosa Parks and how the Montgomery bus boycott got started by Rosa Parks refusing to take his, to give up her seat. But we know very little about the young lady that this coat represents, Claudette Culver. Now Claudette Culver was a teenager at the time. She was on the bus and she refused to give up her seat. And she was arrested at that time and this happened eight months before Rosa Parks gave up her seat and, and it started the Montgomery bus boycott. She will appear later on in this series of coats and it will, she was not able to be the leader or the figure that would be the next person to give up her bus and that's why Rosa Parks was selected. She was young, she was a teenager, plus she was pregnant and the you know, the organization at that time didn't feel that she would be a good example. So Rosa Parks was selected and nine months later, she gets arrested for giving up her seat, for not giving up her seat on the bus. Di Diane Nash, this coat is probably the most significant coat for me because it was the coat that taught me how to make all the other coats. Um, when I originally wrote this grant, I wasn't sure how I was going to do this. And of course, once you get the money, you have to figure out how to do it. So this coat became that particular coat. Diane Nash brought the um, civil rights movement to Nashville. She was um, a teenager at the time. They were all doing sit-ins at various lunch counters and stuff. And as we all know, it was really difficult at that time for them to do this. And it was extremely, you know, challenging because they got milkshakes spilled on them. They all of this stuff, but they did not fight back. And eventually what happens is one day, Diane asked the Nashville mayor, do you feel it is wrong to discriminate against a person solely on the base of their race or color? Once that was answered, the mayor turned around and Nashville, Tennessee became the first Southern city to um, desegregate lunch counters. Ella Josephine Baker. Ella Josephine Baker was an all around activist. She participated in a lot of the organizations um, at the time. She also was a, she was a community activist in the sense that she felt that individuals should stand up for what it is that they wanted. And she also felt that her philosophy was to develop and encourage leadership through the leading civil rights movement organizations in African-American communities. She believed in group-centered leadership, not the leadership that was happening at the time. So she's a very strong figure in the sense of her whole sense of being, um, of, of wanting people to be a part of, the, of all of the things that were happening at the time. Daisy Bates. Daisy Bates um, is very pivotal in, in the civil rights movement because she took care of the Little Rock Nine um, teenagers that actually um, was going to Central High School. Most of the times the teenagers would end up at her home. They would either, they would do their homework, they would, um, they would um, start from there because they were being escorted to school by, by um, by police and so forth. And so they met there at our home. One of the most interesting thing about every time I read a story about a different woman, I always wanted to find something that was personal about them. And that also it would lead to individuals wanting to know about, more about them. Daisy Bates had this beautiful picture window for her home. And throughout the times that this, the Little Rock Nine were there at her home, her windows got shot at, bricks got thrown at it, everything. And it became very pivotal to me to, to make this window become a part of her story. Because the one thing she would not do to, in order to make sure everyone was safe, she wouldn't board up the entire window. So as you can see on her coat, only parts of the window are boarded up or, or left untouched. And therefore the Little Rock Nines were still secure and safe. She goes on to become the, to become, you know, be awarded by the presidents and so forth. But she really did help the Little Rock Nine 
and getting through their school words, getting through everything that they were going through. And that's really what she did. Amelia Fulton Robinson. Her code is very significant because her code represents how, um, how, how on the J Edward Petty Bridge that the uh, marchers were attacked and everything and how um, they eventually do march across that bridge, but it's much later. During the time, John Lewis actually, you know, I know throughout all of this week, we all have been hearing a lot about John Lewis because of the fact he passed away, but he led this march across the Petty's Bridge going over the Alabama River into Salem. The protesters were attacked by the police with tear gas and billy clubs. And Amelia Robinson, actually, she ends up in this incredible photograph where she was being held by someone after she had been attacked. And that photograph goes around the world. Eventually, the march does happen. King comes and the march happens. And also, President Lyndon Bean Johnson, um, on August the 6th, after the Bloody Sunday event, passed the Voters' Rights Act by signing it. And she was awarded later the Martin Luther King Freedom Medal in 1990. Dorothy Hyatt, President Obama called her the godmother of the civil rights movement. In reading her story, she made, she was able to um, do a lot. She was involved all in a lot of Washington politics. She created this um, group called Wednesdays in the Mississippi, where women would go down to Mississippi and help, uh, help people learn how to vote and learn more about what to do in order to register to vote. Now, as she read an incredible life and, and as I went through it, the one story that stuck in my mind was the end of her book. There's a chapter towards the end of the book. When she, she wanted to purchase this building, and the building is actually on Pennsylvania Avenue, not too far from the White House. And at the time when she was trying to purchase the building, they were telling her no African Americans would ever own a building on Pennsylvania Avenue. But that did not deter her. And she went ahead and she raised the money and she purchased the building. So during the time after all of this happens and they get the building for the um, for the for the for this black organization, women's black organization that develop leaders and leaderships in um, moving forward. She reads this newspaper article and in the newspaper article, she reads about a young girl, two young girls were, um, they escaped and then they were captured, recaptured as slaves and then they were resold. Now, the interesting thing about all of this is this building, which is for the National Council of Negro Women's headquarters where it stands, was at one time the slave market in this area. And that building, as it is down from the White House, it is now the National Council of Negro Women's Headquarters. And what you can really say is it really changed that karma around because no longer are people being sold as slaves, but now African American women are trained and work towards being leaderships and add to the community. Ida Mae Holland. She's like one of my favorite ones that I read about. Um, she was um, a prostitute and in all in, in her earlier life. And what happens is one day she follows this young man and she follows him to this building. Now, of course, being that she was a prostitute, she's feeling that she's going to make some money. And therefore, she follows him into the building. But little did she know that once she crossed that threshold into the SNCC office, it would change her life drastically. And it did because all of the young individuals that were um, involved with SNCC at the time encouraged her to go back to school and to um, 
move on, move forward. And she learned about the civil rights movement and et cetera. But the really great thing is not only did she go back to school, but she became a professor. So no longer was she um, being that person that was, the pro that was the prostitute, she now was a part of the academic world and being a professor. And she wrote a book called From the Mississippi Delta, which tells her life story. And it was actually put into, it was actually made into a play. She has this wonderful quote towards in her book that I liked a lot. And it says, the world begins when you were born. It will be whatever you make it. And she really made sure she transformed herself and made it a much better world for her. Joanne Robinson. Joanne Robinson is a very interesting individual. Now, remember I mentioned Rosa Parks and Claudette Culver? Well, of course, Rosa Parks refused to get her, but her seat, she gets arrested. Now, Joanne Robinson, the night that she, the night that she was arrested, goes to her college, because she was a professor at the time, goes to her college and her and her students print up all of these flyers on a mimeograph machine to be passed out among the African-American community, telling them to stay off the bus the next day. So they put, they did close to 15, 52,000 handbills and they passed them all out and they got it done like overnight. And of course, we all know historically that the next day everyone stayed off of the bus. And of course, that gave birth to the Montgomery bus boycott. Now, because she was a professor at school, she was not really able to be in the front line to um, be acknowledged. But she did a lot of the behind the scenes regarding the Montgomery bus boycott. And of course, it also brings to light Martin Luther King at the same time. So what's interesting about this code is that the first half of this code talks about the, the right, hand, right hand side of the code talks about the fact that this all starts and it starts December 1st, 1955, the Montgomery bus boycott. Then it's a year later and, and Claudette Culver and three other defendants are, a lawsuit is, is going through the system, through the courts and the Supreme Courts and everything. And during, and by December of 1956, um, the, the Supreme Court declared segregations on buses in Montgomery, Alabama as unconstitutional. Now, Claudette Culver was not so much a part of the, the, the whole experience of, Montgom of the Montgomery bus boycott, but it is her lawsuit that she was a plaintiff in that helps this, like this law pass through, through, um, through the Montgomery boycott. On the other picture in this slide is a picture of how they all got around. And these folks did a lot of like, com the community really did come together and really stayed off of the buses. Darlene Mott. She's a very interesting person in a lot of ways because it's her lawsuit that helps impact one of our commitments. Um, her home was broken into and um, they found um, paraphernalia that could arrest her for it. So instead, they took it to the courts, to the Supreme Court. And it's the Fourth Amendment that says that the government cannot search your body or house unless they can prove to be judged that they have a good reason. Therefore, search warrants came into being and from this lawsuit and said in favor that it was unlawful search and seizure and it could not be used in a criminal, in a criminal pr prosecution. This particular code um, also holds that story about her and how the ruling went through the courts. And now 
anytime someone searches a home, they must have a warrant and a search warrant in order to do so. Harlette Walls. Harlette Walls was the youngest of the Little Rock Nine. She was um, very, can't remember her exact age, but she was the youngest of them. So when she was, when she was chosen to end up going to um, Central High School, her parents decided that they wanted to get her a dress, a store-bought dress. Now in those days, African-Americans could buy clothes, but they couldn't try them on in the store. So her mother bought her the dress, and on the first day of school, she had worn it, but she wasn't able to get in to the school because of being blocked by protesters that didn't want them to integrate the, the school. And then she eventually re wears the dress much later, and again, much later. This dress now is in the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. And at the time, it was this, just the Smithsonian. She does graduate from Little Rock, and she talks about the challenges, the many challenges she faced in that desire to get a, a good education. And um, so even though you can't see it in the coat, one of the things I put in there was this dress and how she it was her power and her perseverance to get a better education to um, move forward. Um, one of the things I learned in creating these codes and reading about these women was I learned a lot about the fact that the civil rights movement was really all about lawsuits and everything to make people, to make African Americans have a much better life. And that's really what it was all about in many ways, and I was very surprised by that and how um, due diligent everyone was in pushing the laws into the courts and making those things happen. The Lovings Co. The Lovings were an interracial couple that lived in Virginia at the time. And Virginia had this law in the books where um, interracial couples could not be married and um, they could not live together. And in fact, the woman, her name is Mildred Getty. She was, um, she was arrested and went to jail. So finally the NAACP, their lawyer, lawyers came and helped them take this to the court systems and to make that be that that they could do it. So it's basically what they did was it says that the 14th Amendment requires that the freedom of choice to marry not be restricted by individual racial discrimination. And under our constitution, the freedom to marry or not marry a person of another race resides with the individual and cannot be infringed upon by the state. So the loving couple, one of the really the interesting thing about what happens with their lawsuit is becomes the opening of all the other types of marriages that happens afterwards, like in, including gay marriages, et cetera. Um, when I created this code, one of the things that I, I did was I created those rings in the front coat, and I did that all through free, free standing embroidery, free hand embroidery on my sewing machine. I was so proud of this coat and the story and how it held that story together. Ruby Doris Smith Robinson. She, she was a very interesting individual. And at the early part of her life, she began fighting um, racism and segregation as a Spelman student. And she got involved in the student nonviolence coordination and, and she was a part of and she worked on creating no bail policies during the Freedom Ride Rider campaign. She was also she was also involved in the Mississippi Freedom Summer campaign in 1964. The interesting thing about her story, she doesn't live to be very long, she doesn't live for a long time. 
And the very beginning of her book actually is about her funeral because she dies unexpectedly from some type of the disease. But she always knew that she would be a part of working with the civil rights movement. And there's a really wonderful story in her book where she talks about how she's gonna be arrested. And her and her friend, they dress up in all of these clothes. So when they get arrested, they would have, you know, an extra set of clothes on and they would be warm and everything. And it's very touching and telling about the times because it, once you got arrested, you were put in jail, but you had no amenities. And so her and her girlfriend made sure that they were going to be warm and, and be able to sustain that night. She, um, she was very much aware of, um, she dies tragically in 1967, symbolizing the mark of the demise of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the birth of the Black Panther. She was, a, she was probably one of the first women to wear an Afro. She was around when Stokey Carmichael starts to take over and we move towards um, Black power. So I indicate mostly in her, about her, is that she was that bridge between those two movements that started to happen. Dorothy Cotton is another individual that was very much involved in um, the civil rights movement. Um, for her, the civil rights movement rearranged the social order of this country and did not emulate from the halls of Harvard and Princeton and Cornell. It was simply the unlettered people who learned that they had rights to stand up for and no one can ride your back if it isn't bent. And in fact, that's the title of her book. It's called, um, You Can't Ride a Back That Isn't Bent. So her life work and her philosophy was all involved with nonviolence. She was a member of the Southern Christian Conference and the inner circle to Dr. Martin Luther King and a close colleague. In fact, she was with King the day before he was killed. And the day that he is killed, she's on a plane going back to Atlanta and she hears the news. And she was also a part of the party that went to Norway when King received the Nobel Peace Prize. So even though she wasn't a high leader within the organization, she was involved in many, many ways because of her involvement with Martin Luther King. Septina Clark. She was an educator and a civil rights activist. She believed in the importance of education and spent her life teaching African-Americans to become potential voters. And one of the ways she, she actually taught was she taught through, she taught people how to read through a Sears catalog. You know, I know now today we don't see many catalogs to purchase things because we all have everything online. But in those days, Sears catalog was the best book going and people had them. And so she really did teach a lot of reading from that. She was a part of the citizen school that she taught reading to adults through the Deep South. And she was a part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and she direct, and the Director of Education and Teaching. She struggled also, like many of the women did during the Civil Rights Movement, with the sexism in the movement. And she really felt that women being treated unequal was one of the greatest weakness of the Civil Rights Movement. And a lot of the women that I have read about, especially Robinson, Clark, Paul, Pauline Murphy, all of them believe that, um, that women should have and should have been seen more publicly throughout the movement. And some of them really had a hard time being a part of the movement because of that. Annie Mooney. Annie Mooney writes a book called Coming of Age in Mississippi. And it is at the age of 15, she realized, because this is like in the very first part of her book, she realized that she could be killed for the color of her skin. That's a very interesting concept for someone so young 
to realize that that you um, that you could be killed because of the color of your skin. And even today, it's still an issue within our in our times because of all of the police killings and and so forth. She she's she was very much involved in the NAACP, SNCC, and CORE, and she helped plan the the events surrounding the 1964 Freedom Summer. She was um, towards the end, and I think it was with a lot of various leaders. They were they were skeptical about whether all of this change in these events really meant something, and it really worked. And and in doing them, um, are we making a difference? So towards the end of her memoir, she reflects on the events she had witnessed and remembered the words of the movement's anthem: "We shall overcome. We shall overcome." we shall overcome someday. As she writes the last sentence of her book, she says, I wonder, she wrote, I really wonder. So it goes to show that it wasn't so much, they wanted to feel like they were really contributing and towards the end of all of this, she wasn't sure that she was. Pauline Murphy, she was someone that got denied going to Harvard University and because of her gender. She turns around and she becomes the first African American to receive a law degree from Yale um, Law School in 1965. She was a lawyer that argued civil rights and women's rights for the national for the NAACP. She publicated, she wrote an article regarding Jane Crow and the law. Sexual Discrimination and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. She was, she was really into women's rights and, and an advocate for them before we really thought about them a lot. And she really was the one that, that fought hard for women, for a woman to be a part of the March on Washington and to be a speaker, for that person to be a speaker there. Because at the time, that they weren't, they weren't invited to be what, someone to speak at, on the, during the March on Washington. She eventually leads the courts and court and academia, and she becomes the first African-American woman to be adorned as an Episcopalian priest. So she has a lot of firsts in her life, and she did a great deal in, in what she was doing as, um, as part of the civil rights. So now these particular photographs will be slides of the installation of the show at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. And as you can see, all of the coats at this time, I think there were about 16 coats. Some were on um, dress forms and some were hung on to the wall, like the green one in the back. And then, of course, Fannie Lou Hammer's coat is on the wall that shows how the coats were made and produced, but that coat is still requesting me to make her, and I finally started working on it again. Questions? That's it. Patricia, thank you. That was fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had a lot of interesting questions. There is a lot of interest in your choice of the swing coat. Um, is there, how did you decide on the coat, first of all, and the swing coat as an object? Is it a metaphor? Um, well, did it, you consider other shapes? Well, one of the reasons why I selected a swing coat was, number one, it actually is my favorite coat. I love the design of that coat. That coat, any woman in the world can wear that coat. And then looking over a lot of pictures, especially when I was doing Diane Nash's coat, you could see in some of the pictures that women were wearing them during that, during that age, during that period of time. Another reason why they were selected was, because they were wide enough to carry and hold anything I wanted to say on them, whether I was putting photographs, whether I was embroidery, the story on them, 
And, and that was important that I could be able to say a part of it, a part of a story or a situation and people would get it. And so that was one of the main reasons why it was selected. When I first started doing them, I made them very long and it wasn't until a little later, they all became shorter coats. <laughs> Well, did you start with a commercial pattern or did you just create your own? I used the actual commercial pattern. It was a um, folk pattern, in fact, and I used it through all of them. All of the only coat that fit for me really is Diane Nash because it was the first one that I created from a sample I made. And um, all the other coats are like size 10 or smaller um, as the coats were designed. Okay, do you ever wear the coats? That was a question. <laughs> no, they're actually very heavy. They consist of, instead, of, we all know a quilt takes about three layers to do. My coats actually are about four layers plus a lining inside and a lot of heavy stitch work, which you can't really see in the pictures that I've showed, but in some of them you can, but the stitch work was really important and it's actually almost like painted. Great. Um, so one other question is, everybody's really interested in how you approach the design, design decisions and construction. Um, were the colors indicative of, of the women you were portraying? Did you do more patchwork for some than others? And then, you know, how did you approach the design? Did the woman's life inform those decisions? You know, when I first started most of the coats, I was I had them all over my apartment. I would cut them all out at one time and they would all be on different hangers and through and on the walls, you know, pinned together. Each coat actually um, defined almost how they wanted to be made. A lot of times I would have dreams after I read it, the story about them and I would think, what part of their lives do I want to project or put into the coat? And I would do that. Um, the only coat that I actually made special things about making sure it came out right with color was the loving coat. I had that off, I had that winter white fabric, wool fabric, and I said that was perfect for that coat. And so that was what I used. But a lot of times the stories would come to me from them. They seemed to like, um, you know, they were like, my friend has, we call them the girls actually. And they have a way of talking to each other and being almost alive within the space. And that was another reason why the coats were used was because I wanted the coats to represent a human being and they do that. And when they're hanging in the center of the space, they really move and it has the spirit quality to them. Great. How did you decide which heroines to honor and were you able to talk to any of the women who inspired your coats? The, I read, a, I found a book in the library and it was titled The Forgotten um, Herons of the Civil Rights Movement. And I had taken the book out of the library and I had looked through it and based it and read some of the stuff, but I never really thought about it again until I sat down to write the grant. Now, when you sit down to write a grant, you have to think of something you can use. And that book came into mind and I started thinking of how I could create these codes and they could all be in a, um, a room and they could form this march and people could move in between them and all around them and everything. Little did I know that that was gonna happen and I'd have to really make that happen. But they, each one I tried to find was someone I didn't know anything about. And I will say this much, I did live during the era of the, I grew up in the era of the civil rights movement. Because I grew up north, I really did not know a lot about it. But when I embarked on this project, I actually learned more about the civil rights movement than I could have ever thought I would learn. And each woman, I tried to, at one point, I was so in Mississippi. Man, every time I look, I was pick, picking someone from Mississippi or in the south. So then eventually I had to move up closer to the north. And the north, the issues were handled differently compared to in the south. Because you were born in Biloxi, right? Uh, yes, I was How old were you when you left? Yeah, I left when I was a child and I grew up in New York. So I, I wasn't involved. New York was very different, you know. I mean, there were issues and so forth, but I didn't really know them. Because when you're a kid, you don't pay that much attention to stuff like that. Yeah. 
Um, lots of people want to know a little bit about the quilt behind you. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, the quilt behind me is, a, is my very first story quilt. It was created when I got accepted into the Florence Biennale in Italy. And at the time I was painting gigantic paintings and I knew I couldn't take paintings to, um, to, to Italy. So I did some research and I created three story quilts about African-American women during um, the slavery time, during slavery and colonial times. And the way the quilt was designed is that the center of the log cabin is the ghost image of these women and then the pattern around it was the, the patterns around it were all batiks and African fabrics. And then I created this wandering stitch throughout. So it became, these quilts became the story of me honoring these women as well as paying homage to where I come from and know that this wandering stitch meant I'm still looking for who I am. And there were three of them made. One was also on slavery and off to Italy we went and packed them in a gym bag and we exhibited two of them and I slept under one <laughs> the entire time I was there. So that quilt does get put into an installation piece much, much later. What a great story, what a great story, I love it. <laughs> so uh, many people have said, um, will you publish a book? Are you going to publish a book? We want to take this into the schools. We want to spread the word about this. Have you thought of publishing a book with these quilts and the stories of the women? Yes, I have. I actually am going to do that as soon as I finish my last four coats. And then I will have 20, which is my ultimate goal. And I will then write that book. I've started it. I've put some stuff together regarding it. But I'm looking to make sure I have all 20 and and then also just make it a little more alive. So that was the other question. Do you plan more in the series or are you finished at 20? I'm finished at 20, except that I may have a commission for two of them in South Carolina that I've been asked that will possibly be happening. I'm looking forward to moving on to new work. I've been doing this series for quite some time now. Well, one of the comments in the chat um, not wasn't really a question, but then there was a question that related to it was when you combine wearable art and activist art, it's a new category for all of us to consider. Brilliant. And then the question was, have you thought about the next generation series of some of the leaders today in the Black Lives Matter movement? No, I actually have decided to move forward into an entirely different subject. And that subject is surrounding um, domestic violence. So it's, I still will be doing the activist stuff, but more or less on a more personal level because I really feel that the stories of the women that managed to make it through domestic violence is not told. And I really wanna be able to tell those kind of stories. And I have started working towards those pieces. And one of my pieces was called The Wedding Coat. And it was in the Pacific, um, Pacific International Quilt Festival here. And it won first in show for 2018. So that was my clue to say, oh, we know where we're heading now. <laughs> I was happy to see that in the show and happy to see your award. Congratulations. Thanks. So you're going to continue to work in the swing coat format in this next series? The, the next series, the coats are going to be more geared to the 50s. I have a really beautiful pattern that I'm planning to use that is a 50 styles coat. I still want to keep the, in the coat, one of the reasons why I select these types of coats is because I have more surface to work and put the story on. Um, the first wedding coat was done where it was very sleek and very um, close to the body. And even the second one I'm creating is the same way, but I do have um, a 1950 pattern which I will be using to create the cycles of domestic violence on three of them. So these cults will be a little different because they, they won't be all the same as the, this series was, the swing cults. Fascinating, wonderful. Um, we also saw some of the images of your exhibition at San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. Um, do you have a preference in how you exhibit the coats on a mannequin? I know we put one on a wall that wasn't finished 
Mm -hmm. and you like the, the swing coat because you have this flat surface to work on that then becomes three-dimensional. Do you have a preference for how you like to exhibit your work? The, um, the very first, the way the coats were thought of being designed and exhibit was they would hang from the ceiling into the space. I had an exhibit at this place called the Brick House in Sacramento, the Brick House Gallery in Sacramento. And it was a huge place. And we were able to hang these coats from the ceiling into the space with fish in mind. And therefore, when people walk up to them, they could see the coat and everything, but the, also the coat had this kind of different energy in it where they moved around. In fact, the gallery owner, she said that there would be days she would come in and they would be moving around so much. It was almost as if they were talking to each other and everything. So it was this whole sense of where I wanted the coats to come alive. And when I did the um, reception that night, I went to the reception and I finally saw these coats the way I really wanted them to be seen. It touched my heart so much that by the time I got back to the hotels, I was in tears <laughs> about it. So that's my real preference. But when they're on at least the dress forms and everything, people have the opportunity to walk around them. They have an opportunity to, to interact with them in some ways. Um, when they're on the wall, it's a little different, but they still have a sense of that interaction. And that's what I really am looking for, looking for is to make sure people have a way to interact with the pieces. And maybe they can walk away and they want to learn something more about that person. Well, the museum curators are on this call and I think there's some other curators on this call. So let's talk about your next show <laughs> in San Jose. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Is there anything that we didn't, I didn't ask you that you would like everybody here to know? I think the one thing I really would like people to know is, is that even though the civil rights movement happened so long ago, there are so many issues from that that is moving into Black Lives Matter. And that if you can take just one person, even if it's a person I never talked about, you know, read their life story. You'll be surprised what you can learn from those individuals. Some of these women, like for example, Fannie Lou Hammer, who I can't seem to get her coat made, she was ignorant and everything, but she went through a lot to be a part of the civil rights movement to get people to vote. And whatever happens this year, please get out and vote. That's my little spiel for, the, for that. <laughs> wow. You know, I can't top that. So I think on that note, I just say thank you so much, Patricia, for being here today. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. I, I enjoyed every minute of it. And thank all of you for coming. And we look forward to seeing many of you next week for the Modern Quilt Guilds Textile Talk. And thank you again to our sponsors, Equilter, Misty Fuse, Moda Fabrics, and The Quilt Show. We really appreciate your support. Thank you, thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I enjoyed. Bye. Bye.